so many groups on the Right, it makes sense that instead of keeping us close, instead of traveling to some people, maybe they ask me if it's hard to hear you like the box here. Yeah, but maybe you don't think it's good, maybe I can finish laying it on the box side. The other thing I've been contemplating too is I already have one Thursday scheduled. I'm contemplating whether or not to do it full time. So I think one and then see if people are coming in or not. Because it gives a lot of the people are actually responsible. Like I said, it's for primary financial you are? No, no, we uh, he, uh, yeah, it's, it's strange that he's in the same that he's in the same Right, I usually think that he's in the same Well, he does live in the same Right. Well, he grew up in the same I didn't know that. I know he's in the same way. Yes, I think he's in the Okay, so it's 12.45. Thank you all for coming. I see some regulars, of course, from last year, and I'm very happy to kick off another year of the Ken Reese Memorial Weather Briefings. They will be every Tuesday at 12.45. I'm also playing with the idea, I was doing this last year, too, of adding a second day. It would be Thursday at the same time, 12.45, since the scheduling kind of works out. So we might try that once here. Um, and then see how it goes from there. And actually, uh, Rich Grum will be the one Thursday here next week that we're going to try and see what the attendance is like. I know Thursday's scheduling is a little bit different than Tuesday's, but not much. Um, but we're happy to kick things off with another one of our AccuWeather friends, uh, Mark McKenna. And you have an interesting history because you didn't get right into forecasting. You were teaching at the high school level and now have gone to AccuWeather. And you're from UMass. We don't typically have UMass grads either, so it's nice to see a UMass grad. And, Mark's going to talk about the long range forecast and I'll let him have at it. Good afternoon. How are you? Doing well. Good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, as uh, Daniel was saying, I'm originally from uh, Massachusetts. I graduated from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell all the way back in 1996. So I look around and I see the technology that you guys have here and that we have at AccuWeather as well. And I just remember taking the uh, ADA model, which most people won't remember, off the DIFAX max it off of UMass Lowell and hang them on the wall and waiting for them to dry so we can look at them. It's quite the change and uh, it's really amazing when you look back at time. But as Daniel also said, I feel I consider myself very lucky. Meteorology has always been my love. Um, unfortunately, when I graduated in 1996, I wasn't able to find a meteorology job in the field for a long, long time. And it took over a decade, actually, of looking to finally land a job at AccuWeather. So I consider myself very lucky. So even though I've only been at AccuWeather about six years now, I consider myself a meteorologist for basically all my life, as almost everyone does here. One thing I wanted to say is um, please stop, ask questions at any time. Another thing, and I'm going to get into this with our philosophy with our long range team at AccuWeather, is we kind of, when the famous and uh, world famous Mr. Bastardi left, we changed our philosophy a little bit with our long range team where he was basically the man in charge. And he, if you didn't like your, uh, your idea, basically you were kind of out of luck unless you can really change his mind, which was not going to happen most of the time. We have several members of the team. Only one is full time, that's Paul Pastelock, but we have a bunch of members that work part time as full-time employees, meaning that they work full-time, but not everyone is doing long-range duties all the time. I'm one of the per person's people who does long-range duties all day, every day, but not that's not my only job. I do several different things. I'm going to show you a couple of things I do. But let's get back to um, the forecast and what I wanted to show you. One thing is uh, one thing that I do as specialty at AccuWeather is I run AccuWeather Astronomy. So you can say this is my shameless plug to like this page on Facebook and to follow my blogs. If you're into astronomy 
whatsoever. Um, we've had a lot of growth recently. I have over 27,000 likes on my page, and we have over 3,000 people, generally 4,000 people talking about it every day. I mainly, I write some blogs, but mainly it's a picture. Um, send us your picture, we'll share them. And so we have a lot of professional photographers that sh share um, any astronomy related issues, but I also do blogs and I'm running a contest right now, a photo contest as well. So as I said, if any of you and I wanted to show you with the um, rocket launch last Friday night, this is a view that was sent in from a Penn State student. Um, I don't, where was his name? Michael Scott Brulo, and I shared his. He was, um, he said he was from the Nittany parking deck looking just north of the West Halls. You can see the rocket launch. And this was late on Friday night. So I share stuff like that all the time. So if you're interested in photography, astrophotography, please follow it and uh, send us your pictures. But back to more of what I was going to talk about today is the long range. <clears throat> and um, this is some of the work that we do on a daily basis. As I was talking to Daniel, um, next week we have our winter meeting where Several of us, there's about five people that work in the long range team. We get together, uh, we go through our thoughts. Paul has generally, who's the, the, the lead, has his preliminary ideas around and we discuss, we kick around, yes, I don't like this. I mean, no, I don't like this. Yes, I like this idea. I think we should stress this. I really see this. And we did this forecast for the fall and early of winter of 2013, um, mid August, and it was released by our writers, our press release, um, August 20th. Um, and you can see some of the things we're looking at. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but a lot of times we get stuck on what we should put on the picture and on the map. And that's some of the things we there we, we did. And then we wrote some of the um, bulletin, bulletin points that concentrate on some of the ideas that we thought of. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about some of the things that we think of for the winter and fall as we go through time. Any questions so far? Okay. First off, <clears throat> as I was talking about uh, with our rearrangement of the long-range team, our Paul's philosophy is the better, the more minds that's thinking on this, the better. Um, we generally do that in forecasting, and you see that when you play forecasting games. It's usually, as long as you don't have a couple slackers, consensus is a pretty good forecast, and it generally beats any specific forecast that a person has. Yes, there are cases that a, a particular person may be consensus on a day-to-day -day basis, but in the long range, the average, the consensus will win. And basically, that's a lot of back to whether it's philosophy is that, and that's what we have map discussion, as Heather says, is that we'll tell you that people come together, we talk about what's going on in the weather, we share our opinions, and unless we can come to an agreement, we're not going to make a change or go somewhere. A lot of that philosophy is trans transferred over to the long range team where if you have an idea, if you want to share something, you want to talk about something, Paul encourages it to bring it to the table and talk about it. And um, we do that all the time. So one of the things I show up here is my contact information is right here, just parkhead at AccuWeather.com. And Hunter, who is a person I rely on pretty heavily, who helped me put this together, his information is there. So if you have any ideas, and you don't understand the amount of people outside of AccuWeather that contact us if we share our information and say, hey, I think it's going to be really warm in Chicago next week. I get that email from a guy almost daily. And then a person in Connecticut we need, is always talking about snowfall and relating to ENSO patterns and what's going to go on and different things. So if you have anything you ever want to talk about, I, I freely encourage you to write down my email, write down Hunter's email, and contact us anytime. And I will get back to you, I promise you. Because the more people, I, I have the same philosophy that a consensus, a group idea, will beat my forecast almost every single time. Um, I like to think that. But I like to think sometimes I, I can do pretty good on my own. But um, I will start here. So. <clears throat> So we're going to just preview a little bit about the winter, what we expect that's coming up here. And a lot of times I get the question from, doesn't matter whether it be a meteorologist or more commonly a non-meteorologist, if you can't get tomorrow's weather right, why are you going to be concentrating about what's going to go on during the winter? Excellent question. You know what? He, th those people are exactly right. Uh, I, I find long-range forecasting to 
not be an exact science at all. It's, it's an art. Some people feel that what you can do is forecast using analogs. Just say, OK, ENSO in 1996 was neutral, PDO was positive, AMO was positive. That's how we're going to be. That's what I'm going to go with. And I'll tell you what, the, the summer, the winter, excuse me, of 96, 97 won't be the same as 2013 and 2014 everywhere, just because looking at those three things. There's things that and we've, I've been doing this for three years now, cost rate and long range, that, that you see, that you don't see coming. And they can majorly screw up your forecast in the long range. Um, one of the things that I look back and think about that really screwed up our forecast at AccuWeather is just the sudden stratospheric warming event that we had last winter that shoveled a boatload of Arctic air into our region. And really, and Paul likes to think of it, disrupted the pattern for 90 days or so. Um, in the northeastern United States. And, and that was something that we did not see saw coming, and it's very difficult to see coming. So and one of the things that we saw is that last winter was a basically a neutral ENSO winter. And we expect that for, to be this case. We see in neutral ENSO winters that it's often very difficult to get a handle on what's going to go on until you're almost right on top of it. And I think that's going to be a case for this winter that it's going to be highly uncertain, and there's going to be something that happens, whether blocking sets up because of lack of Arctic sea ice or the Arctic sea ice build stronger or quicker than normal. Something's going to happen, and it's going to be the, the dominant weather maker. And really, right now, we can't look at it and say what that is. So that's why I like to think that long-range forecasting is an art. But there is science behind it. We obviously use models. We look at model data um, with what the PDO, the AMO, uh, the ENSO pattern is going to be. And we can have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. And, and that gives us a clue a lot. Um, I guess another like a long-range mistake, you may want to say, that most people are going with right now is the, the Atlantic tropical season, where there were very few people that saw the position of the hive near the Azores being so strong in the Saharan dust. And it's really not so much Saharan dust, but it's coming off the dry air, it's coming off uh, Europe, and really put a, 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 a damper, to say the least, on the Atlantic harvest and cane season so far. Um, I guess Humberto, if that's not named a hurricane by tomorrow, it will tie the, the last that it's ever been um, had an Atlantic Basin hurricane, which was 2002 and Gustav, I believe. So pretty impressive. And realistically, we're, we were forecasting an average, just slightly above average hurricane season, and that's not going to happen. And really, that the reason why it's not going to happen, it was very difficult to see, and we didn't see that. But let's get into a little bit of this slideshow again. If you have any questions, please ask. Um, I'd like to engage with you. <laughs> OK. So some questions that we asked about this winter forecast. And I, I will preface this by, this isn't AccuWeather's forecast. It's basically me and Hunter's ideas. And we've come up with this together. So um, take it with a grain of salt, and even AccuWeather's long-range forecast you can take with a grain of salt, it's going to change uh, and won't be perfect. As I talked about ENSO, what's ENSO going to be? What we find in long-range forecasting that it's good to have either a strong La Nina or a strong El Nino. If either of those cases happen, we get a pretty good handle about what the upcoming winter is going to be. If that is not the case, then we'll have to look at some other things and some other uh, wild cards, and I think that's exactly the case this year. I'm not expecting, and no one is, uh, a strong La Nina or a strong El Nino. Rainfall in the east, will that recent rainfall, how will that impact the winter forecast? Uh, most often we look at rainfall as in terms of the summer. Mr. Vistardi, Joe, and Paul are big fans of this. In the summertime, where it's dry, it's going to be warm. Winter, you can't necessarily correlate that. But we, we do think that rainfall does have some impacts in the long range pattern. How this winter compared to last year? For the everyday person, that's what they most remember. They don't remember the, the winter of 96, 97. They remember last winter. Is it going to be colder? Is it going to be snowier? That's a, a common question that most people ask that look at the long range forecast. And 
last but not least, who will see unusual cold and who will see unusual warmth? Uh, a degree or two above normal or below normal is generally what we will target as unusual cold or unusual warmth. Okay. Some things we'll talk about, what we expect for teleconnections this year, some analogs we used and why, um, ocean temperatures, how they're behaving right now, how they're expected to behave as they go into the winter, Arctic sea ice. Recently, there was some uh, interesting pictures, to say the least, of Arctic sea ice this winter or this summer compared to last summer. And there's been some questions about at AccuWeather with the meteorologists how that may impact the winter forecast. And last but not least, this is Hunter's um, quote unquote baby here. I don't know too much about it, but he has this theory that he uses that it's a 90 day give or take pattern that tends to repeat itself um, time after time. And he talks about it a, a, a lot about it. At, excuse me. He talks a lot about it. Generally, it's over my head. and. I tend not to use things that I don't understand too well, but I'll, I'll introduce that to you as well. Current sea surface temperatures, and excuse my typo right in the middle here with neutral, um, a slight La Nina signal to the equatorial Pacific, west of South America. Nothing to um, be in the definition of a La Nina, but it's the, it certainly has a signal to it. And, but stronger signals, we have a positive PDO, which has, was pretty unusual. Last winter in, in, in the spring, we had a negative PDO off the coast of the Pacific Northwest that caused some drier than normal conditions, we think, to that region. Right now, it's positive. Um, and we expect it to stay positive for a little while. So does that kind of factor into the long-range forecast? And a positive AMO, Atlantic multi decadal Oscillation. And that has been pretty much on and off dominant for a while now where we've had a positive AMO. And so values for the, going back the last decade or so or a decade and a half, notice since early last year we've been basically in a neutral ENSO pattern. And notice the slight La Nina signal here in the last couple months, but we actually don't expect that to last, or at least the models say that, that it's going to be basically neutral. Um, Here's some the model forecasts from mid-August about a month ago, some plumes expecting the neutral ENSO pattern to continue and to slightly go towards ENSO. Remember, to get an ENSO, we need a three-month average of one or above, so we're not going to be expecting to get into that neighborhood. So we're expecting the La Nina-like pattern to wane and an El, uh, El Nino pattern to kind of begin, but not be strong enough to affect things majorly. We ex that's what the models are telling us. Another uh, forecast for the cold months, December, January, and February, made in late August. For the equatorial Pacific, notice that the La Nina signal has kind of flipped, and now it's a weak El Nino signal. But notice that the, another thing, we still see the positive PDO general, generally in the stronger or positive AMO off the Atlantic coast, where that may affect how um, early season northeast snowstorms have play along the I-95 corridor. We've seen time after time from New York City to Boston down to DC that if the water off the coast there is too warm and you have a strong nor'easter, it doesn't really matter what the thickness is or what's going on, the coast is going to change terrain and a lot of people will be, well, snow lovers like I will be disappointed. Uh, uh, the traffic people are a little bit happier. European ENSO, this was the CFS, I believe, yep. Again, shows the same thing for the cold months, December, January, February. The La Nina signal fading and the El Nino signal taking off, but not taking on off enough to be considered an El Nino, so we just consider it a neutral event. Okay, CFS forecast, and this is temperature precipitation for the six-month period, September through uh, February 2014. Again, this is just a model, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, Paul, when we came out with our summer or late fall and early winter forecast, what he saw was a, for the northeast, which a lot of people we forecast for, a cold snap in November and a very mild December. And... Um, 
The CFS doesn't necessarily show that as well, though it does say, show some warmth up here. Oops. Uh, what's that happen? Huh? Wait, that's it, he was thinking mid to late month or Perfect. around mid month, but it's the, the recent thinking, and we're going to have to talk about this as we go through time next week when we have our discussion. Is that we're less confident in the cold snap happening. We think that warmth is going to be the way to play uh, October and November and, and December as well. Uh, but just that's just what the CFS is showing. Temperature wise, notice September. It's got a pretty good handle. What's going on? What temperature though? Two meter temperatures. Yeah. The, the, for September, it's got a pretty good handle. What's going on? The warmth across the west and the, the western Canada, while slightly below average for the east, pretty good handling. What's going on? October, expecting it to be mild around here, and then it gets into a changeable pattern where it's still showing some cool in January and February. For precipitation, those anomalies? Yeah, anomalies. Are they standardized or they just regular? I believe they're standardized. But uh, I'm not, a lot of people I find in this industry are model jumpers and um, model worshipers. And I think I'm more of an old school, maybe because I'm older, um, that I, I tend to not discount the models, because if we don't have models, we're not going to be able to forecast as well, but kind of just get an idea of what's going on and what's compared to history. And I find it's in the long range, there's people that believe analogs, and then there's people that believe models. I think like blending both is the best way to go. And it, yeah. You should be who blended those papers on analogs. It takes about 10 to 30 years to look at analogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We we just look at the last hundred years, and there's no way to, to say that. That's ten to two. Yeah, it, it's it's a good point, and and a lot of times. What? Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> twenty ten to twenty eight power ain't that big. So, uh, um, and a lot of times we just look at the last analog that looks up. We don't even go back two or three. We just look at the last one, that, and and that's not necessarily the best way to go. But that's interesting. I'll take a look at that. Euro, this is the recent monthly for, um, I believe this was December, January, February. It does show a general cool <clears throat> snap across the Great Lakes, Mid-Atlantic, Central Plains, and nothing in much of uh, terms of way, precipitation anomalies. What we've seen with precipitation anomalies with the Euro model and the monthly is that it generally will just go over with what the uh, sea surface, or in this case, like, the Great Lakes temperature anomalies are. If they're warmer than normal, generally they show above normal precipitation. And uh, so you get month or season? Seasonal. It's the December, January, February. Yeah. So it's those three months, the cold months thrown together. So it's pretty dry. Yeah, pretty dry. I mean, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, not really matching up with what we're doing with yeah. the forecast right. for uh, temperature wise across the Didn't east. Did you have flooding in the southeast too? Yeah, we, we've been thinking, especially later in the fall or mid-fall on into the early winter, that it would be wet in the southeast. Based on what? Um, just that we thought it was going to be a late tropical season, that some tropical moisture could be drawn into the area. The fronts get stalled down there and run into some tropical moisture. Um, just kind of that idea. But that map you had up at the beginning was for the fall. This forecast is for the winter. Too distinct. They yeah, overlap. but they overlap in November and December because the fall forecast yeah was November into December. So okay. there's a little bit of overlap. Okay. But you're right. I mean, it's not exactly the same idea. This was um, <clears throat> the ice sheet that I talked about a little while ago. How uh, this was all the rage on Facebook with a bunch of people I follow who are um, against the idea of man-made global warming. Um, that this is just the same time period, one year apart, with the Arctic sea ice and how they differ. Um, and we were talking, this Dale Moeller at, at work was talking to me about this, and he thinks that this newer ice sheet over here is very shallow, very thin. It may not be as big as a deal as some people are making it out to be. But it is. If you look at volume, the volume jump has not been nearly as massive. Right. But in any case, the, the ice that's on the water has been, is pretty impressive, but as he said, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Oh, I'm John. John, I'm okay. It's okay. Yeah, the volume and the, the amount of ice in that area isn't nearly as dramatic. There was some big wind events last year that helped break the ice. Yes. Really. Yeah. It, it makes, it's all about the wind stress. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So Hunter and I put this together, uh, basically just saying, <clears throat> there's that increase in Arctic sea ice, is that going to play a major role in the forecast? As I said, we'll talk about that as a team that you other next week. In my opinion, it's really too early to tell, but if anything, I mean, it, it certainly could play a role, but it's probably too early to tell. Do you have any model simulations that say we have a role in the cloud? No, I do not. I, don't, I haven't uh, really gone into that much detail to look at that. Do you think they have something like that? Where they, I'm sure they have a model simulation of the Arctic sea ice and how it's going to turn the ice on or off in the model. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Switch. Yeah. Despite the, the difference between last year and this yep. year, this year is still, it's either the fifth or the sixth least, least right. ice cover in August since 1978. So it still ranks in the bottom of all the years. Mm -hmm. It just happens that last year was so bad. Right. So many standard deviations from average. That this year looks fabulous mm -hmm. in comparison. I agree with that. That'd be like um, football analogy with uh, <clears throat> Matt Castle coming in or a backup for Tom Brady, and then Tom Brady coming and throwing some passes, and it's a dramatic difference, but it's based on your baseline what you're starting with. Right? Who's Tom Brady? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, going through some of these analogs, these are some of the analog years that we're using. I know it's a little tough to see, but some of the um, <clears throat> subjects that we're comparing, this right here in this chart is just how the temperatures in, matched up in both June and Temperature and precip matched up in June, how the temperatures and precip matched up in the spring, and then in, in general how they matched up in the summer as well. So this isn't based upon PDO and AMO or ENSO, though it is because we, we eliminated the ones that didn't fit well in, but these are some of the analog years that we're looking at right now. But I, I forget that you said that I think a lot of times Paul is too, at work, is too um, driven by analogs. And just because analogs show something and then it happened the winter past that doesn't mean that this year's analogs, even if they're a perfect match, that winter will these occur. These temperatures, are they, are they from like the United States? Or yeah, the just the U.S. <coughs> we usually just use the data or the North America that we can have the most reliable and best set of. What if you get the results to the correlation to the 500 height patterns that are seeing? That could be very well, or let I me mean, use the whole northern hemisphere or something like that. That would probably be more worthwhile than just looking at a small corner of the globe. We often, again, we, we generally focus on the U.S. way too much when it comes to the world and forecasting. And I mean, it's almost like we, we, we joke at Acura that when we do map discussion that very rarely do we have thunder in Canada. Across, and so we always say there's an invisible policeman at the borders of Canada and the U.S. and doesn't allow thunder to go across. Of course, the weather doesn't work that way. There is no borders when it comes to the weather. Um, but yeah, some of those analogs are pretty self-explanatory and it shows why we're using some of those ideas. Throwing those years together into just our plug and chug uh, analog creator that the CPC, CDC that we get from um, this was June 2013. And then what we have is several different years, the analog years, different temperature analogies for June, June precip. And then we kind of use those years and then we throw them into uh, what the CDC analog creator would, would put for the different winter months of 2013. So there's December, there's January. Is February for just temp oh no, that's precipitation. Those are all precipitation. So in the, in the left slide, temp is on the yeah, left. Yeah, the temperature is on the left and the precipitation is on the right. Yeah. Mark about five minutes. Okay, five minutes. So there's December, January, February. Just got it. Um, one thing that Paul is very keen on is that he thinks it's going to be a very warm December based upon some analogs and some things he sees. And there's the winter as a whole right there. Yeah, I mean, one thing we're pretty confident of, and again, this is our winter summary, and so is it going to be a major factor one way or the other? Um, one thing 
We got burned by the SSW last winter. We're looking at it again. Uh, chances are that two SSWs directed towards the eastern United States won't happen in back-to-back -back winters, but that's just playing the odds. Just pure math. It has nothing to do with science. Um, <clears throat> Just mild start across the eastern half of the nation uh, with some cooler snaps for January and February. I think if we, you took out the SSW from last winter where that Arctic air was directed towards us and really changed the pattern, we were on a pretty typical winter pattern recently uh, for the eastern U.S. where it was fairly mild in November and December and it was off to a mild start in January. Then it, that really upset the pattern that was starting to set up and then it changed and became cooler, especially I think if you look back at March, I, I, I believe our anom anomaly was negative two or negative three from March, which was, which was pretty chilly for recent uh, springs, especially compared to the spring before where we had that ridiculous warmth of uh, 50 degree lows and 80 degree highs for like five days in a row that had um, the, the trees uh, growing and stuff like that. Um, Henry, um, you mentioned Henry's going to come speak here a little bit. He has a, a pretty wide audience and he sent an uh, interesting email. One thing you hear a lot, and I'm sure you do as well, is that the woolly worms, the, the thickness of the squirrel's fur, uh, the thickness of like a deer hide, like what does nature say about what the winter is going to be coming up? So he sent a uh, an email, I think it was from an Amish farmer that said, wow, our apple crop is bumper as compared to last year. And, and he's like, well, did you remember that there was like an April frost last year that killed all the apples around here? Because I know I have an apple tree in my backyard and it was last summer I have no apples. This year it's full of apples and it was all just because, like you said, you judge it upon what the baseline is. And the year before, there was a lot of hurt in orchard farmers. And this year we had a lot of rain early in the spring, I mean later in the spring and early in the summer and that helped produce a pretty good crop. But I mean that's a question that comes up from time to time, do you believe in that? And then well, we need to go check the pig spleens as well. Pig so, spleens yeah, is a good spleen. indicator? Yeah. That's a very good indicator. Okay. They should have an index on that probably. Get one false positive you go out of the base man road. So you have to have a lot more than just you have to have a large sample size. <laughs> Any questions? That's basically my presentation there. And as I said, please take down my information, take down Hunter's information. If you have any questions or just want to chat about the weather, we're always, as I said, our general philosophy in the long range team, more minds, more hands in the kitchen, kitchen are better than less hands in the kitchen. So, yep. Not a question, but yeah. observations. Number one, don't be so hard on yourself when you said that the average to above average hurricane season isn't going to happen. I mean, we're, we're just at the peak. I mean, there, it's not out of the question that there could be a flurry of hurricanes if the Mad Julian oscillation gets in the right phase. So, I mean, I don't think it's dead yet. Yeah. I think you're being a little too hard on yourself. Yeah, I think the writing's on the wall. Okay, that, the yeah. writing's probably on the wall. Yeah. The second thing is, I think when we talk about long range work like this, we ourselves, as a profession, get ourselves in trouble, at least some of us do, by using the same word, forecasts, that we use when we put out a one, two, or three day prediction. These, these products, in my opinion, should be called outlooks. Yeah. And the word forecast shouldn't even be mentioned. when Because I, I understand maybe that's not going to solve the problem. But the more we use the word forecast, mm. We're using the same word that we use to convey one to three day or whatever. And it's not the same thing. Yeah. It's not even close. I agree with you. I mean, you, I look at what my employer's doing with the 45 day forecast, and. Oh, I wouldn't even go, go there. Right. Is, that, <laughs> right. is that a ridiculous joke? Since, yes, it is. It, it, it is. I mean, it tries to predict whether there's going to be a snowstorm or a hurricane in the middle of October or middle of November, 45 days out. It's not going to happen. Well, but, yeah. I wasn't intending yeah. to go. No, I, I, I was really you. intending to yeah. say you did use the word forecast sure. a lot when yeah. talking about this product. Mm -hmm. And I think if we would all get in the habit of using a slightly different word, it might eventually rub off the public. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's a good idea. I also like the word trends for. Yeah, like this. trends. 
Yeah, something other than forecast. You should forecast for what you're confident in in the short term, mid and long term trends or outlooks, what we think is going to be wetter than normal, cooler than normal, et cetera, et cetera. Tropical for you. Alberta was still a uh, tropical storm. Yeah. Gabriel's also back. Yeah. As well. I mean, if you really want to yeah. aggravate yourself, watch NBC nightly news the day that the National Weather Service or the Climate Prediction Center issues their winter. I think they actually, I don't know if they use the word forecast, but they call it an outlook. Yeah. Brian Williams will read the doggone thing verbatim. And they'll show a map, and they'll give you the impression that we know that it's going to be colder than average in the eastern United States. It's just awful. Yeah. It, it, and if there's no other news that day, it'll be the lead story. Yeah. Because NBC is owned by, or NBC owns the Weather Channel, which so does the weather. So. <clears throat> yeah, it, I, I I tend to agree. I mean, any time we're thinking of longer than three or five days out, it should be more not a forecast. It should be a different. Wordage. Yeah, and the guys here on the weather communications team do such a nice job with the 12 day trends. Mm -hmm. So when they want to talk about the, the 7 to 12 day period, they use the word the Dan, which I think is very appropriate in that frame. Well, you should try to get a patent on that, then. You could be a rich man. Because <laughs> <laughs> you probably won't be in this field. Common enterprise yeah. in their patents. Any other questions for Mark? Uh, next week will be another AccuWeather uh, forecaster on Tuesday, Dan DePondland, and then Thursday will be Rich Grump. Same time, 1245, same location. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.